Welcome to worship. I'm glad that we can join together. And even though we do lose something, not being able to see each other beside us. This Sunday, whether we are apart because of weather or health or whatever reason, know that we are still gathering in spirit. And I hope you know that when we gather together, God is there with us. So, it is good to have you here with us, and please join us now for our time of worship. Amen. We'll be singing I Come With Joy, number 515 in the Glory to God hymnal. I come with joy, a child of God, forgiven, loved, and free, the life of Jesus to recall, in love laid down for me, in love laid down for me. I come with Christians far and near to find as all our food, the new community of love in Christ's communion bread, in Christ's communion bread. As Christ breaks bread and bids us share each proud division ends, the love that made us makes us one and strangers now are friends. And strangers The spirit of the risen Christ, unseen but ever near, is in such friendship better known, alive among us here, alive among us here. Together met, together bound, by all that God has done, we'll go with joy to Reading Psalm 147, 1 through 11. Praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God on the harp. He covers the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain and makes grass grow on the hills. He provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of the warrior. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. God, we thank you for the beauty of your creation. We thank you for the beauty of fresh snow and for how it makes everything look pristine and clean. And God, as we come to you at this time of worship, we pray that we would see ourselves as you see us. Beloved children, Beloved children who make mistakes, who fail you, who disappoint you, but that you don't toss us aside. You invite us to turn over a new leaf and to return to relationship. God, we thank you for your unfailing love, for your mercy and your grace. We thank you that in this time of worship, we are strengthened and encouraged and built up. It's been a long year, 
and it's not over yet. We have to stay the course. Give us patience. Give us perseverance. Give us self-control. God, we remember those of our church family who are struggling with health, with lack of jobs, with emotional issues, with family issues. God, whatever we struggle with, we thank you that you are there, not taking away the struggles necessarily, not making everything go away, but reminding us that your strength is sufficient, that we can lean on you and get through anything. We thank you for this church, for the way we are able to continue to minister in our community despite COVID. We thank you for this day, for this time, for this life. Help us to make good choices each and every hour of the day. Choices that point to you, choices that serve you well. In your son's name we pray, amen. We'll be singing, I have decided to follow Jesus, number 305 in the hymnal. Our text today comes from Mark chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. The text goes like this. Jesus went out again beside the sea. The whole crowd gathered around him, and he taught them. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alephus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When, Je when the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners. When Jesus heard this, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to them, Why do John's disciples 
and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast. Jesus said to them, the wedding guest cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast on that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old cloth. Otherwise, the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wineskins into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and the wine is lost. And so are the skins. But one puts new wine into fresh wineskins. A few years ago, I returned back to the university where I did my undergraduate and then later my seminary studies, Baylor University in Waco, Texas. I hadn't been there for a couple years, and I had heard that they had done some renovations on the campus, and, and wow, they had. When I returned back, a lot of things were different. There were big changes. And I'll be honest, a bit of me didn't enjoy them. This was the place where I had spent my undergraduate years, and now, seemingly a few short years later, maybe a couple more years than I would like to admit, I've returned back and everything's different. But what made this really disingenuous was that if I was honest with myself, most all the changes they made were actually better. Literally, there was a place that used to just be a parking lot, a concrete eyesore that I walked across to go to classes, and they had gotten rid of the parking lot and put in its place a large, beautiful grass field with trees. I saw current students laying down, relaxing, reading in that field, tossing around a football. It was obviously a change for the better. Likewise, there was a place on campus called Fountain Mall. When I was there, there was no fountain because the old one had long been in disrepair and taken out. Well, they put a new fountain there, and it does look great. But, I admit, even though part of me knew it was better, part of me was not happy with it. It was change. It was something new. It was different. This, I think, is something that all of us deal with, some more, some less, of how we deal with change, with something new. We're continuing on in the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. This Gospel we'll be spending a lot of time in this year. We have been moving through the first two chapters, giving us a little bit of an introduction. Next week we'll hop and talk about the Transfiguration, but for this week we are ending in this chapter 2. And in it, Jesus addresses an idea of change. Jesus has come into the world bringing something new, a hope, a transformation. Jesus is doing something different. The kingdom of God is changing things. The kingdom of God brings new life into our world every day. And the question for us is we should ask, how can we enter into this kingdom? Or maybe, how can we deal with this change? The first thing I think we need to notice on a base level is the kingdom comes in people and places we might not expect, nor want. As Jesus is just in the beginning of this gospel, he's still putting together his group of disciples. And he picks Levi, who we find out the one thing about him was he was a tax collector. Jesus not only picks him, but he goes to dine with him. He sits down. He dines with tax collectors and sinners. I don't think these are supposed to be too separate of a category at the time, I think many would have seen tax collectors as synonymous with sinners. Perhaps this is just saying there's other sinners besides tax collectors in this group. They must have been pretty excited. 
Usually a traveling rabbi would shun them, not dine with them. But still, there is something that is shocking. The scribes of the Pharisees start to say, wait a second, Jesus, if you're dining with these people, not with good religious people like us, could you be saying that they are doing right? Aren't you approving of their actions? And, and I think for many of us today, we might be sympathetic to the idea that tax collectors' actions should not be approved. <laughs> we already are not too great on tax collectors these days. But back then, beyond just collecting taxes, tax collectors, and we said this before, but they were collaborators with the occupying Roman government. They were betraying their own fellow citizens. And they made money by charging extra on top. So the more money they made, the more successful a tax collector they were, the more money they were taking from those people around them. In particular, we think a heavy tax burden fell on the poor, the needy, those who were just struggling to get by. This was not something glamorous. It's something we all would probably say, that is not right. And so you can see their concern. But Jesus is not having any of this. The first thing Jesus pushes back is, and states is that I'm here to help. And, and these people need help. I, I think Jesus is noticing two things. One we see that Jesus in the kingdom of God extends to all sorts of groups of people. Jesus' followers will include tax collectors like Levi and zealots, those wanting to overthrow the Roman government, following the same person. We see poor fishermen alongside wealthy women and benefactors, all following Jesus. Jesus brings these people together and helps them all see a new way. But the second thing is this interesting statement where Jesus says, a physician comes to those who are sick. I have come not for the righteous, but for sinners. Now we might protest, wait a second, Jesus, you seem to be all about righteousness, saying how we should do right things. But I think perhaps the fact that the Pharisees would have saw I have not come for the righteous as saying, well, then that's not, you haven't come for us then, is part of their problem. I don't think Jesus was supporting the idea of tax collecting in the way it was carried out then. Instead, I think Jesus was supporting someone who wanted to follow Jesus, who wanted to imagine a world in a different way. Someone who knew that perhaps they had done wrong but were willing to truthfully come and talk with Jesus. The tax collectors and those sinners knew who they were. The Pharisees could not see that they themselves were sick. This is true on a level that we can see, right? If there is on a sports team, a player who is more talented but never listens to their coach, the coach might say, well, I'm here for maybe the less talented player but who is willing and open to coaching. They can learn and grow and become something more. Or, or like in a class, it's a similar thing. A student can have a lot of skills, maybe better grades, but if they won't listen to their teacher at all, then what's the teacher to do? The teacher's there to teach, and the student maybe with worse grades who's more willing to hear can hear more. This should be a warning to us in the church. We can all easily see ourselves, and this is a pitfall that I fall into many times, see ourselves as the righteous ones, as the ones who attend church, but may we remember that Jesus came for those with faults, which is good news because if we remove our rose-colored glasses, we will notice that we are in that too. 
It also is a call for us to remember that the church is an open and welcoming place. It is a place in which all are welcome, even those we would not expect, to come to talk with Jesus, to hear about the kingdom, and to participate in it. No, Jesus loves all, and the kingdom of heaven brings people in. And if we are able to see it, it can bring us along too. But what is it bringing us into? This is where this part moves into this interesting second session. Where Jesus invites us to discern between the old and the new. Often people read that last sentence and see this as two examples of old and new. The clothes and the wineskins. But really I think this is three examples, or at least one real-life example that then leads into these two stories. Because this first conversation about fasting is a discussion between old and new. Fasting is an accepted Jewish practice. It is something that is valuable, that has helped them in their faith. It is something that they do. And the Pharisees notice that Jesus' disciples are not doing it. They're doing something new. They're not fasting at all. Why, they say. And Jesus says it's not the time for them to fast. They might fast in the future, but the the wedding feast is now. The bridegroom is here. It's the right time and the right place for celebration. And so you see then in those two examples when he says you should not use a new unshrunken piece of fabric on an old cloth because the new fabric will tear away when it shrinks. Similarly, you shouldn't use old wineskins with new wine or they'll burst. In one instance, the new item is the wrong thing to use. You need a pre-shrunken piece to repair it. In the other instance, the old item is the wrong thing to use. Jesus is not just saying, do all new things all the time, but instead is saying to discern, to know what is right, to read how the Spirit is moving. My grandmother and my grandfather ate healthy and as one should in their older age. But when us grandkids came over, my grandmother had a cabinet and she would pull out all our favorite treats. Cookies, candies, we had popsicles in the freezer. She had all the things we liked. And even my grandfather and my grandmother would let off a little bit of their diets and enjoy them with us. The reason why was that their grandkids were there. This was a cause for celebration. New rules were in place. My grandmother knew that she shouldn't say, well, no, we're eating this way, and when y'all are over, you're just going to have to do it too. Now, of course, they weren't eating anything risky, just having a little bit of a celebration. Because they loved their grandkids, and my grandmother knew that this was the time to celebrate. Jesus is saying this is the same way with his disciples. They are celebrating something new. In church life, we can often fall prey to two pitfalls. Changing something just for the sake of changing it. Or doing something because it's the way we've always done it. I think Jesus is saying... This is not an easy answer, but the answer is is that instead we need to prayerfully discern where the Spirit is leading us. What is the best path forward? Sometimes even the thing that's worked for us for a long time needs to be laid aside for something new. But other times, like fasting, sometimes the thing that is good has a place. And even sometimes complicatedly, what can be right for one group in the church is maybe something that needs to be changed for another. But before we go too much into that, I want us to look at, though, the context of this parable. Because the kingdom of God here is offering something new and exciting if we can see it. So, like I said, I don't think Jesus is saying something new is always better. But I do believe here in this context, Jesus is bringing in the kingdom of God, something new to the world around him. The kingdom has room for all. 
even tax collectors. The kingdom is showing that God's favor is there, is lifting up the poor, those oppressed, those in need, is helping the sinners. It is something worth celebration. It is imagining a new world around it. It is changing things. And Jesus is offering an invitation to open up, to allow room for the kingdom. That invitation is there for us today. And I think Jesus warns the Pharisees can't imagine this. They don't want to do this. And they're losing out. I remember as a kid, I was as forgetful as I was today. And one time my mom got me those fancy soft drinks uh, in a glass bottle. Well, sometimes when it was fresh from the grocery store, they had been in our pantry, the refrigerator just wasn't cooling it down quick enough. So, usually with a plastic bottle, I would go stick it in the freezer and get it real cold. Every once in a while, I forgot. And when I forgot, in a plastic bottle, it would just swell up. Maybe the cap would pop off a little bit. But of course, the glass bottle, as I soon found out, if I, when I forgot it in the freezer, there was a loud pop. And as we all ran in, my dad soon explained to me how when that ice expands and is trying to be held in that container, it explodes forth, it shatters. It's not a great result. The, the chemical reaction or the reaction of, actually I guess the more physical reaction of it freezing and expanding is a change. Instead, it needs to be in a container that has enough room, enough space, and maybe even an outlet. Now, I know this is maybe not the best example, but I, I think this is what Jesus is hinting at here. The kingdom of God is moving in new and unexpected ways. He's warning and saying it's going to burst forth. Don't try to contain it, to put it just in the box that you can understand. Instead, open up. Allow for it to expand. You'll be surprised where it takes you and where it goes. As followers of Jesus, especially in today's day and age, it can be hard. It seems that so much energy is just for us to maintain. The trials of the modern day and age buffet against us. It's hard enough just to keep things like they were, much less imagine things in a new way. But I hope that we maintain that sense of wonder. I hope that we listen to Jesus and open our hearts to the new ways the kingdom of God can expand and move. Because that's the wonderful thing about Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that lives in us. That expansion, that excitingness, those new exciting ways the kingdom was moving was not just in Jesus' time, but in ours. So may we be open to the ways the kingdom might move in new and unexpected ways around us. May we be able to celebrate it, and maybe even live into it a little. So, we will always struggle with change, that old and new. And like I said, I think sometimes the old things are appropriate. but Sometimes the new things are too. May the Spirit guide us, allow us to be a people who change, and allow us to see the new and exciting places Jesus might lead us. Would you pray with me? God, help us. Allow us to not make your grace and your world too small. Lord, help us see not only your love and your life and the people around us, those we might not expect, but also, God, help us to learn from them. Lord, your kingdom is exciting and wonderful. Lord, help the Spirit guide us. Teach us what things to keep doing and what things to imagine in a new way. Lord, we cannot contain your kingdom, but we pray with grace and mercy that you allow us 
to come along for the ride. We're thankful for what Jesus does in our lives and in the world around us. May we bring your love and compassion and peace to all those in need. God, guide us this week. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. We'll be singing We Are Called, number 749 in the Glory to God hymnal. week, may God continue to speak to you and the world around you, both in the ways that you know and have heard many times, and also in those exciting, new, indifferent ways. Amen.